Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Greetings in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on this beautiful Easter Sunday. And as uh, you may remember from the announcements, we are in the sanctuary worshiping. Nice and spread out. So, praise be to God on this Easter Sunday for the greatest gift ever, the conquering of death itself. A few words about today's service. We'll be taking communion later on, so if you have something to eat, something to drink, we'll partake together later in the service. Um, Next Sunday is first Sunday of April. We would usually be in person, but we will be online. Um, Just a reminder, because I'm going to be flying out um, Wednesday. With, uh, with the boys to see my parents. And I will bring back pictures and video from the eclipse. Because that's a um, week from Monday. So it'll be partial here. So if you want to go take a look, but make sure you have something. So as we enter into our time of worship, I invite us to sing together the Lord's Prayer. come to our time of prayer today, um, we want to continue to remember uh, Ukraine, Gaza, and Sudan, Haiti, and all places with strife and turmoil in this world. Christ is risen, but the world has not yet fully embraced that message. And so we continue uh, in war and strife. Today also is the uh, is Trans Day of Visibility, and so we want to remember and lift up our our trans siblings uh, who face a lot of discrimination and hate, and especially in recent times with a lot of laws being passed and, and a lot of just falsehoods out there about what it means uh, to be trans and and what that experience is like. So remember our trans community uh, today as well. What other prayers do we have today? Okay, so prayers for the Cardenas family and the Anderson family as they've lost uh, lost loved ones just, uh, just this past week. Prayer concern, if you think of it, my mom um, 
just found out a few days ago she has a kidney stone and she's so she's in a lot of pain and on heavy medication and so on so and, and Jenny said oh that's a real bummer are you gonna be able to go and I'm like well it actually might be helpful to have us there because she she's probably gonna have a hard time helping with my dad so I think that the timing actually probably works out well yeah Right. Prayers for, shall we say prayers for all conspiracy-minded folk out there yeah, who yeah. latch on to all kinds of things. Um, yeah, like, like oh, the Trans Day of Visibility is on, on Easter Sunday. It was a plot. It's like, well, this has been happening for 15 years on March 31st, so it just happened to kind of coincide this year. And uh, on a podcast, as I heard a podcast uh, a couple days ago, he said, and the hosts were talking about it and said, you know, one of them said, you know, in this year, we have the Trans Day of, of Visibility, and it falls on Easter Sunday. And he said, that seems appropriate because we're divine pe- beings that are something. And I was like, yeah, there you go. So, but yeah, there are so many conspiracies flying around of all kinds um, in our society right now. Too, too many to name. Yeah, wisdom for all of us. And that truth would be known. Like really just truth. Not even big T truth, just true things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a praise and a concern that the the uh, ship with the dock, the pier for Gaza is almost there, and then within two weeks after they arrive, there'll be that uh, point so they can drop things off by boat. But but uh, prayers for the distribution once it gets there, even um, trying to figure out how to get it around because they don't have vehicles to transport things around, and you know that the people with with weapons are going to be the ones who will control things. So. Yeah, and, the, and the, the starvation is is just getting worse there. You know, stories of people eating grass and anything they can find and, and children dying, and malnourishment. So something needs to shift there. Well, let's go to God in prayer. Alleluia. What was dead shall live. What was dark shall shine. What was forgotten shall be remembered. For the Lord is risen and walks among us. Let us confidently bring before God the needs of all the world, asking for God, asking for renewal, responding, Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. God of life and gratitude and great joy, we laud you for the gifts of Christ's resurrection. On this day, give us hope, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. On this feast day, which brings joy to all Christian believers, may we commit ourselves to work together toward the unity of the church, that Christ's body may be one. For Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Honoring the gifts of Christ, Christ's risen body, may we rise to serve all whose needs keep them from seeing themselves as the image of God. For Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. For all who have need of the gift of Easter, for all who journey from illness to health, health, from despair to hope, from grief to consolation, from loneliness to love, for all our siblings, that death may have no more power over us, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. For all who suffer and all who mourn, 
that today the Lord God will wipe away all tears, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. May we have the persistent faith of Mary Magdalene and the surprised belief of Peter and John. May we long to be God's sign of life in our world, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. May we be one in faith with all who have died in Christ, for our life is hid with Christ in God, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. For all the specific prayers that we've mentioned here, the places and the people that need your touch, and for all those held closely in our hearts, for Christ is is risen. Christ is risen indeed. God of life, we thank you for the mystery planted in us, the paradox of life from death, and the community from scattered disciples. We praise you for the dying which saves us from death, and for the rising with which brings us life. We pray as we live through Jesus, the risen one, and the power of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Happy Easter. The scriptural selection today is from Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they could go and anoint Jesus' dead body. Very early, on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they came to the tomb. They were saying to each other, Who is going to roll the stone away from the entrance for us? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, and it was a very large stone. Going into the tomb, they saw a young man in a white robe, seated on the right side, and they were startled. But he said to them, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He isn't here. Look, here's the place where they laid him. Go, tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. We should have expected this. We really should have expected this. But why, you ask? Let's think about it. The Bible has a lot of stories in it about tricksters. Yeah, I'll get back to resurrection eventually. The Bible talks, talks a lot about tricksters, and probably the best, best known of them is Jacob, right? Jacob, the one who becomes Israel, he tricks his brother Esau out of his birthright, tricks him out of the blessing, um, eventually wrestles with God and is named Israel, God Wrestler. It's probably the best known trickster character in the Bible. Tricksters are interesting characters. Uh, I found one definition. It says the trickster, trickster crosses and often breaks both phys physical and societal rules, violating principles of sto social and natural order, playfully disrupting normal life and then reestablishing it on a new basis. So tricksters change things. They don't follow the rules. They play around with things. And I can't help, and maybe this shows my age a little bit, but I can't help but think of Bugs Bunny as a great example of the trickster character, right? Upending things, playing around with Gender norms, societal norms, 
all kinds of things. But trickster characters are throughout the Bible. We can go as far back as uh, Lot's daughters, who got their dad drunk and then uh, had children by him. They thought the real people left on the earth. So. Uh, and then there was that time. There was that time that uh, Abraham passed his wife off as his sister. And then there was that other time that Abraham passed his wife off as his sister. And then there was that other time that Isaac passed off his wife as his sister. It, it did happen three times. Because they were afraid. They were in the face of Pharaoh and Abimelech, rulers, kings, and they were afraid. And then there's Laban. Laban's great because Laban, uh, Jacob's uncle, is the one who tricked the trickster, right? Got him to marry the wrong one, uh, the wrong sister. I still wonder how that happened. And then there, of course, Jacob himself. But Jacob didn't just do this on his own. He was aided by his mother, Rebecca. So she's a bit of a trickster, too. Then we get Rachel, who sat on the household gods, said it was her time of the month so that they would look there. There's, uh, let's see, Tamar, who, who uh, <clears throat> tricked her father-in-law into giving her a son when the injustice uh, occurred. He wouldn't, he wouldn't own up to his role there. He actually called her more righteous than himself at the end of the story. Joseph, of course, played around with his brothers quite a bit when they got down to Egypt. Moses told Pharaoh that we're going to go three days into the wilderness and worship, and then we'll be right back. Rahab, prostitute who hid the spies from, from the Israelites. Yael, I mean, this who can forget Yael. She's the one who lured the, the King Sisera into her tent, lulled him. I'm going to talk about this in a few weeks, I think, and, and drove a tent stake through his head. Yeah, uh, that's that Yael. Uh, and then Samson, of course. You know, let me feel, the, let me feel where I am. Boom, knocked down the house. Uh, David snuck up on Saul while he was doing his business in the cave. Haman, who tried to... Uh, well, he did. He lured the king into issuing an edict that would destroy the Jews. And then Esther, who tricked him into giving them a defense, outwitted Haman. And they're not just Old Testament. The Magi, right? The three kings, when they show up, they're warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, lest he know where the child is. He snuck away, and Herod was furious and killed the children anyway. But it's not just characters in the Bible. It's not just the people in the Bible. God gets in on it too. God says, Abraham, why don't you go sacrifice that child of promise that I gave you, remember? Psych, just kidding. Nope. Stop. What, what, you, what were you doing? Don't kill him. Again, Tamar. Tamar is declared by Judah to be more righteous than he is. God doesn't disagree. That whole three days into the wilderness to worship thing, well, that was God's idea. God said Moses told Moses to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go three days into the wilderness so that they can worship me. And then we'll, you know, keep going. Um, the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines and gave them hemorrhoids. Seriously, it's in the Bible. First Samuel chapters four through six. And they and they had to make I like gold uh, representations of the hemorrhoids. I don't know how you do that. And they sent it back as an offering to appease God, who had knocked over their God statue anyway already. So there's a lot going on there. 
And then we get into 1 Kings, and uh, God sees this King Ahab, and I'm going to probably talk about him in a few, in a couple months too. Uh, Ahab was a terrible king, did some terrible things. And so God said, is there any spirit here who will go and lie to Ahab? God sends a, spy, a spirit to deceive the king of Israel so that he will die in battle. And even Jesus gets in on it. Jesus gets in on it. Uh, Luke chapter 12, or 16, sorry. Luke chapter 16, um, there's this parable that Jesus told, uh, and this is probably just one example of many, but he tells the story of this manager who um, his, his boss like summons him, and he thinks, oh, no, I'm going to get fired. You know, We don't know why he thinks he's going to get fired. Maybe he was cooking the books. We don't know. But he says, you know what? I'm going to lose my job, so let me get in good with the uh, people who owe me money, and maybe one of them will give me a job. So he calls them in one by one, and he says, how much do you owe? And one of them says, well, you know, $10,000. He's like, all right, well, take, take your paper here and change it to 1000 Pulls in the next one, you know, how much do you owe? Oh, 50000 He's like, all right, uh, well, knock a zero off that. And by the end of the parable, of course, he's in good with all these people. And he's commended by Jesus as a shrewd business person. What? Well, then we get to today's story. Yeah, I was eventually going to get to today's story. So uh, Mark chapter 16. And this is the shortest, simplest, and probably earliest account we have of the resurrection. And there's some odd things in here. First off, who shows up? Who goes to the tomb? Women. Guess whose testimony wasn't valued in a court of law in that society? Women. Yeah. So if you're going to write a story about resurrection, why would you have the first witnesses be women? Because God wounded them. Well, they're going to anoint his body. So it says they, they bought spices and they're preparing and they're getting ready and they're going to, to uh, anoint and prepare his body because it had, they hadn't had time to do it because the Sabbath was coming. So they had to bury him quickly to get him in the ground but, or in the tomb. But then they came back first day of the week after the Sabbath is over. They bought the spices. And on the way there, they realized, oh, who's going to move the stone for us? Like they hadn't thought of that before. And then they get there, and the stone's gone. The stone's been moved. So they're like, okay, great. wonder how that happened. And they go in, and it says there's a young man sitting there. And all the other Gospels call him an angel. But this Gospel, only Mark says, it's a young man. And he uses a specific term for this young man. i got to check my notes here. It's Neoniskos. So in the honest gods, you're nodding like you, yeah, you're, you're great, it's better than mine, okay. Nyanias, Nyanis gods, Nyanis gods, whatever. Young man. But that, that word is only used twice in, in uh, Mark's gospel, and the only other time it's used is at the story when Jesus is arrested, all right? And, and if you haven't read the story of Jesus being arrested in Mark recently, you might not remember this detail, but it is there. Um, it says at one point, there's this one little, one or two verse, two verses, I think it is. Actually, I printed it out here. Here we go. One young man, and it's the same term, one neoniskos, right? A disciple, the only other place this term shows up. Uh, this one young man, a disciple, was wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They grabbed him, right, the soldiers or somebody, but he left the linen cloth behind and ran away naked. Did you remember that one? The, the, the streaker of the Bible? Did you know? Little did we know there was a streaker in the Bible. And, and it's the only other place that, that term is used is here. Which, And one of them, notice, is at the beginning of the Passion, the beginning of the arrest, right? It's when he's arrested. And the other one shows up at the resurrection. And people have been all kinds of intrigued about this and don't know what to do with it. 
Because now the show, the neon discos shows up in the tomb wearing a white robe. Found a robe. Good for him. He's not naked when the women show up. Because that probably would have frightened him and sent him running. Right? Who knows? So he's there, this possibly this naked man who had run away from the uh, arrest, shows up in the tomb, inside the tomb, and he says he's not here. He's risen. And how does the account end? Now, if you look at your if you look in your Bible, most likely there are verses past verse eight, um, but those verses were added much later, and they only show up in some of uh, they don't show up in the earliest manuscripts. It looks like somebody was uncomfortable with the way that Mark's gospel originally ended because it ended with this line: "Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid." Thus ends the gospel. Thanks be to God. Now, I don't know about you, but I, my thought is, well, wait a second. Um, we're here. The fact that we're gathered here on Easter Sunday means somebody said something, right? Something must have happened. So then they added the other accounts, which can, are really probably, with, they, they seem to correspond with some of the other gospels, what the other gospels say. And they have all these occurrences of Jesus. But the, Mark just ended his gospel. with they, they ran away and didn't tell anybody. Now clearly Mark knew that somebody must have been told. Right? So why else would he be writing this? But he ends the gospel there on this cliffhanger. What is going to happen? Will anybody find out? Tune in next week. And yet here we are. We know the answer. Somebody spoke. But the biggest, the biggest element of trickery in this entire passage and perhaps the entirety of all scripture is this one line that the young man says. He's not here. He is risen. Oh, you thought death was the end. You thought death was the end of all this, right? Well, we all die. We all think death is the end, right? And yet, surprise! It's not. We think the gospel ends with the women fleeing in terror from the tomb. But surprise, we're here. So that's not the end of the story. God turns out to be the biggest trickster of all. God goes to the cross, dies, and then pops up again. Surprise. Death isn't the end. Silence isn't the end. Fear isn't the end. There's more to the story. The women got out and somebody told somebody who told somebody who told somebody. And Jesus started making appearances. And pretty soon they realized not only does the story not end with the women running away afraid, but the story ends with a risen Jesus an alive Savior. That's why I titled this God's Biggest Joke. The joke's on all of us. We think the death, destruction, silence, fear, decay, evil, those that's the end of the story. That's how this goes. We look around and we think, yeah, what's our way out of this? How is this going to end? God says, ah, take a look at my book. All through it, people are upending the system. People are tweaking. People are poking at it. People are 
upending our ideas about everything from gender to power, upending our ideas of righteousness and morality, upending ideas of who's in and who's out, who's a sinner, who's not, who's blind and who's not. And it ends with the biggest joke of all, upends our ideas of who's dead and who's not. Let us pray. We serve a living Savior who is alive. That's wild. We read about him dying. And yet, that's not the end. And death and destruction and despair and evil are not the end of our story either. And praise be to God for that. Thank you so much for showing us that you always find a way through. In the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Now I invite us to sing together, uh, Christ arose as we prepare ourselves to come to Christ's table. Christ's table. In this Easter season, we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. For before the resurrection came pain, suffering, and death. And so we remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed and arrested, he had a meal with his followers, and during the meal he took bread, and he gave thanks. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. 
And then he took a cup, and again he gave thanks. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Borei Puri Hagafen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. And I tell you the truth, I will drink not drink again from the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The body of Christ broken for us. The blood of Christ shed for us. Thanks be to God for the gifts of God, for the people of God. of invitation today is thine is the glory risen conquering sun and as we sing this is our opportunity to commit ourselves and recommit ourselves to the God who has overcome the forces of evil sin and death and committing ourselves to following Jesus into the world to bring that message and that reality to fruition so let us sing
as we go into this world that could really use the power of resurrection, may the risen Christ be above us, to watch over us. May our risen Lord be beneath us to lift us up. May the risen one be ahead of us to lead us. May the living Jesus be behind us to push us. May our God of life be beside us to walk with us. May God be within us to love us forever. Amen.